Um, while the folks are cleaning up the bodies, we're going to keep marching forward and talk a little bit about cardiac arrest. I realize it's late in the afternoon, and so we're going to try to keep the message very simple. Unfortunately, cardiac arrest for this year is a, a very simple topic. There hasn't been much at all major or groundbreaking published in terms of cardiac arrest, except maybe a little post-arrest care that you've already heard about from uh, Dr. Malamut and Dr. Winters. So instead, what I'm going to focus our attention on today for this year's cardiac arrest lecture is actually what I think, I wouldn't say groundbreaking, but a practice-changing article that focuses simply on pulseless electrical activity. So that's going to be our theme for today. Now, PEA is kind of a nebulous topic. What exactly does PEA mean? You know, or what do you do for PEA? If somebody's in asystole, you know exactly what to do. There's algorithms. One, it's not even plural, one algorithm. If somebody's in V-fib, you know exactly what to do. One algorithm. Pulseless VTAC, one algorithm. PEA, I don't know. It's, it's all over the map. You're supposed to try to figure out what's going on. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these patients that are really circling the drain. And rest assured, no animals were harmed in making of this lecture, all right? Uh, and we're going to talk about, we're going to uh, go through a case. This is an actual case I'm sure that many of you have seen before. And then we're, we're going to come up with a very, very simple approach to taking care of patients in PEA based on this one article. So this is a 55-year-old man that I actually took care of uh, while I was working in the emergency department. He came in, uh, brought by paramedics. He was visiting Baltimore for a convention and uh, he was having breakfast with a few of his friends and said he wasn't feeling well. And then at the breakfast table, he slumped over and then fell to the floor. Now, his colleagues were not in medicine. They didn't really know what to do. Maybe they did a little compression here and there, but they called 911 right away. And the convention center is maybe a block or two away from the nearest ambulance or fire station. So paramedics arrive there fairly quickly. And on arrival, this is what they see. It's a slow, wide complex of ventricular rhythm. So what do they do? Well, as expected, they start doing some good compressions, push hard, push fast. They did some bagging of the patient, but this patient's clearly up a creek, as we say, right? So patient then arrives in our emergency department, and he pretty much still has this rhythm. It's a ventricular escape rhythm. And the question that I have for you is, what do you do with this patient, right? What exactly is pulseless electrical activity? And I think everybody here knows the ILCOR or the AHA algorithms for PEA, but for which patients do you apply those algorithms? I mean, technically, PEA, pulseless electrical activity, means anytime you don't feel a pulse, but there's actually a rhythm on the monitor, right? Literally, that's what PEA means. But let me ask you this. If you saw this rhythm, would you apply your PEA algorithm, right? I don't think people are shaking their heads. No, I don't think so. This, this is polymorphic VTAC. You're probably going to go down your VTAC, VFib algorithm. What about this? This is, uh, what is this, a heart rate of 300, 150, slow. All right, forget it. It's just really, really slow. Nobody spent time counting. This is almost an agonal rhythm. Would you use your PEA algorithm for this? Or would you use more of like your, your severe bradycardia asystole algorithm? So I don't know that this really constitutes PEA. What about this? Technically, this is pulseless electrical activity, but nobody's going to use your PEA algorithm for this either. You're going to shock this patient, right? Um, maybe you'd use your PEA algorithm for this. It's just plain old sinus tachycardia. So there's a lot of different rhythms for which PEA algorithms actually are not intended to apply. So I think it's important to try to figure out exactly what PEA is. And for some of the practitioners that trained, when I trained or earlier, we all remember the term EMD, or electromechanical dissociation. Essentially, it describes pretty much the same thing. Now, what we're seeing in our society in every first world country around the world is that the incidence of PEA arrest coming into us in the emergency department or in hospital arrest is increasing. And the incidence of V-fib arrest is markedly decreasing. Out of hospital arrest, probably up to a third of patients we now see with out of hospital cardiac arrest are PEA. I remember back when I was in training, almost everybody that came in in cardiac arrest was in V-fib as their initial rhythm. But now, 
it's all about PA or Brady asystolic rhythms. And this is de definitely true for in-hospital also. Some people think maybe that's because so many people out there are on beta blockers, and beta blockers have decreased the incidence of V-fib and relatively increased the inc incidence of PA and Brady asystolic rhythms. All right, so ACLS divides cardiac rhythms into two major categories. There's the tachycardic rhythms, which includes the V-fib, the pulses VTAC, uh, the pulse VTAC, the rapid AFib cardiac arrest, and so on. And then ACLS also has a category of bradycardic type of, out, uh, type of category, or non-tachycardic categories, and PEA is one of these non-tachycardic or non-tachyrhythmic categories, and you see that PEA is only one type of non-tachycardic or tachyrhythmic type of cardiac arrest. So there's PEA, there's asystole, which has another algorithm, there's extreme bradycardia, or agonal rhythm, which has another algorithm, but PEA is a separate algorithm all in itself. And what, so technically PEA is a patient in cardiac arrest who has a rhythm that normally should produce a pulse. So V-fib, normally you don't expect to produce a pulse. So V-fib is not considered PEA. V-tac is not expected to necessarily produce a pulse. So you shouldn't include V-tac in your PEA. Even rapid A-fib or agonal rhythms, uh, those are not considered PEA, all right? So what does ACLS recommend for PEA? You remember, uh, number one, they're, they're recommending you give everybody epinephrine, all right? Everybody gets epi, or if you like vasopressin, you give vasopressin. Everybody ought to get IV fluids. The most common cause of PEA overall is hypovolemia, and so I want to emphasize that. Give everybody fluids, although ACLS doesn't really push this hard enough, but I, I want to start out by saying everybody ought to be getting aggressive IV fluids. If the rhythm's very slow, maybe throw some atropine in there. ACLS is really backed away from atropine, but it's not harmful, so you can add some atropine. And then compressions. How many people would say, if you see PEA as your next cardiac arrest, raise your hand if you will routinely do compressions on everybody with PEA. Raise your hand up. All right? How many people are, are not doing compressions on every PEA? And how many of you just don't take care of cardiac arrest? All right? Ankle pains is my specialty. Okay. Let me ask you this. For all those people that raise your hands, all right, supposing you got a 12-lead ECG on your PEA patient, and this is what you see on the 12-lead, all right? So once again, raise your hands up high if you would do compressions on this patient who's in PEA. Raise your hands up high. I know it's late in the day, but just go ahead and raise your hands up high. So a lot of people, okay, that's not wrong, that's not right. Keep your hands up high. Now, keep your hands up. What if I told you that this patient actually has cardiac tamponade. Keep your hands up if you're doing compressions on a patient in tamponade in PEA, all right? So hands are starting to fall a little bit. It's, it's a little bit variable, and I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, but the reality is if you do compressions on somebody in tamponade, there's some theory, some debate that you might actually be harming these patients. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So it's a bit debatable about whether everybody in PEA should actually be getting compressions, all right? So it is a little bit debatable. So ACLS says you're supposed to try to figure out what's going on with these patients. V-fib, you don't have to figure out anything. You just treat it with the algorithm. Asystole, there's no thought involved. Just do the algorithm. Pulseless VTAC, there's no thought involved. Just do the algorithm. PEA, you've got to try to figure out what's going on to figure out what to do. And then they give you this mnemonic, H's and T's. How many of you feel a little bit like this when you think about all the H's and T's, right? Sitting here, relaxed, here in Vegas, how many people could just nail in five seconds, you can just list every H that's on the algorithm? How many people are pretty comfortable about that, right? What about the T's? How many of you can just nail, sitting here, relaxed? I'm not even talking about being in a code situation all those H's and T's, right? So here's what they are, just as a reminder. Hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion. That's a pretty lame H as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, hyper-K, hypo-K, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and then all of the T's. Toxins, tamponade, tension, thrombosis, meaning big MI, thrombosis, meaning big PE, and then trauma, which means hemorrhage, 
or hypovolemia, that's kind of a little bit of a lame T to throw in there also. So this is what ACLS for decades has been telling us we need to remember. The question is, is there a simpler method of how to approach this type of cardiac arrest? And it sure as heck would be nice if there were, because as we know, the number of PEA patients we're seeing is steadily rising. And it turns out that there is, and this is the article that I just want to focus your attention on. This was published by Laszlo Littman, who is a cardiologist, Devin Buston, who was a second year EM resident at the time of this publication one year ago, and Michael Haley, who's an intensive care physician. So cardiology, intensive care, and kudos to this second year resident for getting involved in this. This came from Carolina's Medical Center. And what these three folks did is they looked at the world's literature at all of the T's and all of the H's, and they asked a simple question, do all those T's and H's actually cause PEA? Because if they don't, it's not worth filling your brain with information that, you, that doesn't make any clinical relevance, all right? And is there a more simple and rational approach to not only coming up with the cause, but treating, more importantly, treating these patients? And they came up with a very simple approach. All you need to do is two things, all right? Number one, get a 12 lead EKG, all right? And Kenji posed for this photo, just so you know. Uh, and then secondly, get a bedside ultrasound. Now, I'm not that great at ultrasound, all right? Haney and Teresa can, can do ultrasound circles around me. The caption down here, uh, if you look up there, says, oh, and here you can see the baby moving his head, and oh, look, he's wiggling his toes, and all you see up there is just a big mess on that ultrasound screen. And that's the way I'm, anyone feel that way when you look at ultrasounds, right? I've got residents who are amazing at ultrasound. They have rotations to just do ultrasound and they bring me these ultrasounds. I remember a few years ago, one of the residents, second year resident, brings an ultrasound up to me and says, Dr. Matu, look at this ultrasound. And there's a big circle there. And I said, oh wow, that's great. Does the patient know she's pregnant? And the resident said, uh, Dr. Matu, that's an eight centimeter triple A. So, so now, whenever the residents bring me these ultrasounds, I just say, we better do something about that, and I walk away real quick. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. But even with basic ultrasound skills, you can nail the diagnosis with PEA because these are not subtle ultrasounds I'm going to ask you to look at. So, EKG and ultrasound. In fact, it's even easier. You don't even have to know how to read an EKG. All you need to do is look at the QRS complex. Is it narrow or is it wide? First question, look at the QRS. Is the QRS narrow or wide? That's the first step in your distinction between your diagnosis and management. All right, so if it's a narrow QRS, you're looking at a patient who's got a right ventricular inflow or outflow problem. Simple. Right ventricular inflow means there's not enough fluid in the tank, they're hypovolemic, or there's something blocking inflow, tamponade or tension pneumothorax, right? or a right ventricular outflow problem, meaning a massive PE. There's your differential right there. So if you have a narrow QRS, it's a right ventricular mechanical problem, inflow or outflow. Now you're looking at this list up here and saying, well, how do I tell the difference between these? By the way, if you look at the list up here, compressions can actually hurt these patients. So compressions are not a universal part of the therapy for PEA if you know the diagnosis. If you know somebody's got tamponade or you know somebody's got attention pneumo, you're not gonna do compressions on them. So very, very important to keep in mind that the simple one-size-fits-all algorithm doesn't work for PEA. Okay, so you've got a differential up here which has been already narrowed because you simply looked at a QRS. How do you tell the difference between these? Next step, take a look at the ultrasound, all right? And use that ultrasound to figure out which of these is going on. Usually your ultrasound is gonna be helpful at telling you the difference between a large PE on the left versus tamponade on the right, all right? Large pericardial effusions are pretty easy to see, even with basic skills. We're not talking about little sliver size effusions, we're talking about big effusions that make a per person have cardiac arrest, all right? It's not difficult to see. Large PEs that produce cardiac arrest, those are not difficult either because what you're going to look at when you look at the heart is you're going to see a massively distended right ventricle and a relatively small left ventricle. If you ever look at an ultrasound in a person who's in cardiac arrest and you see a massive right ventricle and a small left ventricle, then call it a PE until proven otherwise. 
right? And once you look at a handful of hearts, this size disparity between the right ventricle and left ventricle is just going to jump out at you because it should be the other way around. So now you've got your diagnosis, you treat, the, treat them appropriately. Give the fluids to the patient that's hypovolemic, but obviously if it's tamponade, you're sticking a needle in. Tension pneumo, you're sticking a needle in. If it's mechanical hyperinflation, you've been bagging that COPD patient too much, stop bagging and let them exhale. And then suddenly their pulses come back, massive PE, this would be a reasonable indication to give your patient empiric thrombolytics. All right, so look at the QRS, do an ultrasound, boom, you're done, if that QRS is narrow. Now, what if the QRS is wide? Well, actually, let me go back for a second. The other thing I should mention is, all of these narrow QRS types of, of uh, cardiac arrest, or PEA, will be hyperdynamic when you look at the heart. The heart's beating really fast, trying to produce something. They're gonna be tachycardic and a hyperdynamic heart. In contrast, Patients that have a wide QRS are almost always metabolic, tox, or a really sick, dying heart. Very, very simple. So we're talking severe hyper-K, severe acidosis, a tricyclic or some other sodium channel blocker overdose, or in some cases, a massive MI with a heart that's about to stop, all right? because you're probably not even gonna get them to a cath lab fast enough to fix this heart, all right? So, very simple, wide QRS, think tox, think metabolic, and think about a heart that's about to die from a massive, massive MI. How do you tell the difference between these three? Well, oftentimes you don't even need to, but if you grab that ultrasound, you might be able to make some distinctions amongst these, and invariably, this is a very weak, hypodynamic, akinetic heart. So narrow QRS patients have a hyperdynamic, very rapid beating heart. These patients with the wide QRS, the heart's just barely making it, very slow and barely moving. And you know what? Wide QRS means just give empiric calcium and bicarb to all of them. You'll treat the hyper-K, you'll treat the acidosis, you'll treat the sodium channel blocker overdose, and you're not going to cause any harm to anyone. What happens if you give calcium to someone and it turns out that they weren't hyperkalemic? You accidentally gave calcium to someone who didn't need it. What happens to them? Nothing, their bones get stronger, right? So what happens if you give sodium bicarb to someone who's not acidotic? What would happen if I gave everybody in this audience two rapid pushes of IV sodium bicarb? What would happen? Nothing. It gets metabolized, it's gone from your system in 15 minutes, all right? So there's no harm. There's no harm in trying that empiric calcium and empiric bicarb, a couple amps of either one. And yet, if it's hyper-K, if it's severe acidosis, if it's a sodium channel blocker overdose, you just might save a life. All right, so first step, look at the QRS. Second step, use the ultrasound. If the QRS is narrow, it's hyperdynamic heart, get that ultrasound, figure out is it tamponade, is it tension pneumo, is it pericardial fusion, uh, and so on, give them fluids. If it's a wide QRS, the ultrasound will probably show an akinetic heart. Just give them all calcium bicarb. All right. Now, there's a couple of things that I didn't mention. If you remember all your H's and all your T's, I didn't mention hypoxia. Where does that fall in? I didn't mention a hypo K. I didn't mention a hypoglycemia. And I didn't mention a hypothermia. Well, first of all, hypothermia, forget it. All right. Use a thermometer, for God's sakes. All right, forget the EKG. If any of you are using EKGs to diagnose hypothermia, man, you've got problems at triage, all right? So use a thermometer, all right? What about hypoxia, hypo K, hypoglycemia? It turns out when you look at the world's literature, it doesn't happen. It does not produce PEA. I don't know how it got in the ACLS guidelines and how it got in all these mnemonics, but there's no data in the world's literature to support the concept that hypoxia produces PEA, or hypoglycemia produces PEA, or hypo-K produces PEA. So if there's neurons in your brain that are being occupied remembering this stuff, just empty them out and use those neurons to remember something more useful, like your anniversary date, or your wife's birth date, right, or your kid's birth date. You will not save any lives by remembering this stuff. If I save one life every year by remembering my wife's birth date. Okay, so. What else? Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Those can produce PEA. What's your clue? They produce narrow QRSs, but slow heart rates. 
and AV blocks. So if you ever have a PEA patient and you look at the QRS and it's narrow, but it's slow, think beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, all right? All the other causes of PEA arrest with narrow QRSs will be rapid rates for the most part, all right? That's it, how simple is that? So let's just sum things up here, all right? So again, this is from this article. So first step, look at the QRS. If the QRS is narrow, it's gonna be a hyperdynamic fast heart. You see your differential there on the left. How do you decide amongst those things? Get an ultrasound, all right? Now the one thing I didn't mention is that MI with myocardial rupture can produce PEA, but in reality, that's a type of hemorrhagic shock as well, and those patients almost invariably die. But nevertheless, you might be able to make that diagnosis with ultrasound, and that will be a hyperdynamic heart with a narrow QRS. Give them fluids, 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 and if you can, they need a cardiac surgeon. Most will die. If the QRS is wide, then you're looking at tox, you're looking at metabolic acidosis, maybe the dying heart, you're probably not going to save anyway. The ultrasound is going to show a barely beating heart. And how do you treat these patients? Well, narrow, whoop, narrow QRS, give them fluids, use your ultrasound, figure out what the cause is, and then stick a needle in, decrease the bagging rate, or give them lytics, depending on which of those causes are going on. But note once again that a lot of these patients with the narrow PEA don't do well with compressions. And on the other hand, if you have the wide QRS, piece of cake. They all get calcium, they all get bicarb, and if you've got a great story for a massive MI, maybe you can get them to someone's cath lab, all right? But it becomes very, very simple. So, step one, look at the QRS. Is it wide or narrow? Step two, get an ultrasound. Forget about all your H's and T's. Forget about the ACLS algorithm. It's a very nice article, and it really simplifies what we need to do with PEA, all right? That's it, how simple is that? All right, thanks a lot. Okay, perfect.